Hello, I'm Adam. Um, I am starting a little bit late, so I will just try and talk really fast, and I'm sure that that will make the presentation much better. <laughs> um, I work at the Rust Foundation uh, with a, a focus on uh, ecosystem security as a software developer, and a special focus right now around supply chains. Um, I'm also a member of the Rust Crates.io team. For people who don't know Rust, uh, Crates.io is basically the, pa the package repository for Rust. Uh, we call them crates because apparently that was cute. Um, so it's the same as PyPI, NPM. You know, if, you, if you're familiar with any of those, you know what we do. So this talk is sort of related to that work and sort of not, although it's probably a bit more related than it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's definitely more related than it was uh, when I proposed it uh, a few months back. Um, Nathan already covered this like 30 minutes ago, so I don't even need to touch on that. Let's just assume we all chuckled at my clever reference. Um, and obviously, this has become a little more um, obvious given recent events. So I want to talk about this. We've already, I mean, there's literally been talks in this lightning talk slot on like how do we find our dependencies that are problematic. I want to look at this in a more holistic way, not just from a like security CVE kind of way. Uh, yes, I'm aware it says security just there on the on the name of the track, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it a little more a little more um, broadly, let's say. So knowing that projects exist and may need support is different from actually finding them and figuring out what they need. Now I only have 10 minutes, actually I now have about eight minutes. Uh, and I work mostly in the Rust ecosystem, so I'm really just going to talk about Rust for the next eight minutes as my examples. Nothing I'm going to say, though, is exclusive to Rust or any particular ecosystem. So, obviously, this is essentially how do I get to an SBOM, uh, because we need to know everything that's going in. I am not going to attempt to cover SBOMs in this talk, because A, you all know them, and B, it just the slides would be uglier. So I'm just going to I'm just going to use the uh, lock file for crates.io which is one which is a rust project that I work on and we're going to use it as a really just like ghetto sbom essentially. Um, because it has every it actually has all the dependencies at least rust dependencies that crates.io depends upon. Um, I did get cargo to generate a graph of all these dependencies. Um, I'm sure you can all see it really clearly. It's uh, it's super obvious. This is actually simplified too, because Cargo actually deduplicates before it generates this dependency graph. Um, the actual graph without the deduplication um, uh, crashed graph is quite badly. So more usefully, as I said, we'll use the cargo.lock. We can, you know, it's just Toml. We can pull out package names. Um, in this case, I happen to know that all of the packages, uh, all the crates that crates.io depend upon are also themselves on crates.io. We don't have private dependencies because we're not a company and we, you know, there's no such thing as inner source when you work in open source. So it gets us crate names. We can trivially get repo ID, repo URLs from the crates.io API. Of course, we're being very careful to adhere to the API rate limits, not pictured on this slide. And eventually we get to the point where we know that we have 494 Rust dependencies. Um, that's probably more than I can investigate by hand. Um, that's de actually definitely more than I can investigate by hand. We also have 1,999 JavaScript dependencies um, and some unknown number of C library dependencies that I could have generated the numbers for, but to be honest, you know, I, just knowing the iceberg exists is enough right now. So. What can we do with this? How can we figure out where maybe we can provide more help? How can we help the dude in Nebraska? Well, there are obviously tools. OpenSSF has uh, its scorecard thing, which is kind of like trying to, uh, trying to quantify the security health of a repo, uh, which makes sense because one of the S's is literally, I think, security. Um, that's good. That's definitely important. But what that doesn't necessarily tell us is, you know, and I don't want to lean too much on specific examples, but it was on the it was on a slide earlier. You all know what I'm thinking about here. Like, how do we find the maintainers who are struggling? How do we find people who could maybe use a bit of help? Um, so, I'm gonna. I don't think that the current state of security scorecards captures all of this. I think there's, there's, this is kind of a missing piece right now in the, in the public ecosystem. Um, I've been told before that when I rant, it doesn't really come off as very ranty. So if you're expecting fire brimstone, I'm sorry. Um, it is important to publish securely, have reproducible artifacts, sign stuff, you know, know that where the source came from for, for packages, etc. 
But it doesn't, that doesn't tell you much about the human side of it, right? Um, if those things don't exist, it might tell you that the human involved is not doing that. But why they're not doing that could be any number of reasons, right? They might be overwhelmed. They might, be, they might not know that these are things they should be doing. They might, um, they might need help. They might not want help. Um, it could be a project that literally hasn't been touched for seven years, and it will never have a release again because it's actually complete. Um, these are, you know, this really does happen. So these are, you know, we've got to try and figure out ways of figuring out, okay, where are the, I don't want to say weaker links, but where are the links that could use reinforcing, let's say. So it is important, obviously, when we do this kind of exercise that we consider the human at the other end. So, okay, what sort of health factors could we use? Uh, issues, are people actively opening issues? Are these issues being addressed in a timely manner? Are they being responded to in a timely manner? You know, this is all available through the GitHub GraphQL API for Toasters on GitHub, same for GitLab, same for everything else. Pull requests, same thing. How many pull requests are coming in? How quickly are they being dispatched? Are they being reviewed? And so on and so forth. Number of maintainers, is it a single person project? Um, I think the term bus factor has gone a little out of fashion recently, so let's call it lotto factor instead. But like, you know, if they, if they win the lottery, are they still gonna be around? Is there someone else to take over the project while they're on a beach in Tahiti? And, you know, similarly, you know, how, you know, are all the authors coming from, say, the same company, right? Like if, because that can be an existential threat. In a past job, we depended on a dependency that was published by Google originally but then that team got disbanded and laid off and there was nobody at Google who actually managed that anymore. And like, what do you do at that point? Like, you know, yeah, they, they, the people involved still care, but nobody can really maintain it because nobody's being paid to maintain it anymore. And as I sort of touched on, there are different shapes of project. You know, there are projects that are essentially labors of love where it's just like, you know, um, nothing more will happen to them because one person got really inspired for like two weeks and wrote something, um, AKA the origin story of Git before other people started working on Git. Um, so, you know, you've got to kind of know what it is. This is not super qual quantitative, right? Like a lot of this is stuff that you actually have to just go figure out. So I, as I threw together some really simple code to do some level of scoring based on those factors. Um, I, I will put the code up in the next few weeks as not public right now because I'm really embarrassed of it. Um, but I intend to clean it up and publish it and there'll be a blog post and there'll be all sorts of stuff. So this is the least risky entry in the crates, um, in the crates dependency graph, um, according to the extremely um, high tech scoring system that I definitely didn't just throw together on a, on a train trip the other day. Um, this is a port of muscles libm to rust. It doesn't change often, doesn't have a lot of issues reported, has lots of authors. You know, I'd like to give them a high five, but you know, I don't think it's something that we need to necessarily go out of our way to provide extra support to, because it seems pretty well supported. Um, I've got a couple of examples. These people are actually projects and people who are doing fine. So don't go geotan them uh, on uh, social media or GitHub or anything like that. Um, I'm just trying to like show the thought process behind a couple of these. So this is the top ranked one. It is a, Insta is a snapshot testing library for Rust. It's authored by one person. It has a lot of recent acti activity and issues that haven't been closed and the author is accepting sponsorships. So that might be something where you might think about if, th if this is a key part of our testing infrastructure, this might be useful to, to go support. Open SSL bindings for Rust. Um, again, author, author accepts sponsorship. Uh, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of support requests if you look at the issues. That author, I feel like maybe someone should check in with them and see if they could use some help, whether it's money or in kind. Um, the attentive listener will realize that we could, of course, apply this to all of crates.io as well, since we have all the dependency information. I am planning to do that exercise as well, but this is a 10 minute talk, not a 45 minute talk, so I'm not gonna get into that right now. Okay, so back to the main talk. Um, I touched on this, let's say we have dependencies that we'd like to help. What can we do? Well, we can give them money. Uh, if they accept sponsorships, that's probably a pretty good place to start. You could also, if you work for a large company, you could work with someone like Tidelift or someone like that. And in fact, a good scoring thing that I didn't put in is, is this person already being supported by Tidelift? Uh, because if you're importing your dependencies into your Tidelift account, then hey, maybe you're already supporting them. Um, and that's good. But you know, cash helps. Um, the one that I think is underused in the big corp world from my days in the big corp world is in-kind donations. Like, Donating five or ten percent of an individual contributor's time to help with project tasks, or an individual contributor going to their boss and making the case for this, 
is huge for a lot of projects. Like a lot of maintainers are time poor a lot of the time as much as they are poor poor. Um, I, I, you know, I'm personally very time poor. Um, this, and there are so many ways to help, right? You don't have to go in and say, hey, I want to be co-maintainer. Also, maybe I work for a government or a nation state. Um, you can go in and be like, hey, I want to help triage bugs, or I want to review code, or I want to write documentation. As a open source maintainer myself, I love getting people who come in and do that kind of thing. So if you can do more of that, that's great. These are things that an IC can help with that, should, that are easy for a lot of companies, actually easier than writing a check a lot of the time to agree to. But the main thing is you have to ask the maintainer because I can only speak for myself, but I love hearing that people use my work and I'd love to get emails that are like, what can I do to help? But if you do this, you need to be in a position to listen to what they say and actually follow through, not just do what you think was the right thing to do on the way in. Like, again, remember the human. Because I'm going to undercut the entire premise of this talk by reiterating that a quantitative approach only gets you so far. You know, I want to say we can take the things we've got, the SBOMs, the lock files, everything like that. We can find these dependencies, but that's only part of the problem. We still have to look at those dependencies and figure out what sort of help they need and just ask them what sort of help they need. Because this is a maintainability problem, but as we've all seen recently, maintainability problems become security problems over time. So I think this is a way of getting more at the root causes rather than just responding to CVEs and red teaming and all of those things. Not to say those aren't important. They're also important, but we can do more. Thank you. And again, I will be publishing code and blogs and stuff like that over the coming weeks. So thank you for your attention.